Well, good morning. It's uh, May 27th, uh, 2020, and this is uh, Jim and Gary here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum for another installment of Fun with Aviation. And uh, the airplane we're going to talk about today is the AH-1 Cobra. Uh, 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 yeah, this one, this one happens to be an Army model Cobra, and uh, but we're going to talk about the Marine Corps as well as the uh, uh, as well as the uh, the Army Cobra. But this is an AH-1F, which apparently they converted to S's later on. We have two Cobras here, but this is the one that's got a, a cockpit, and we're going to show you that. So we're going to start a little bit of a walk around. Gary worked with these in Germany. Uh, hey, Doc. Hi, Todd. Uh, so we will uh, let him talk about his stories about that, but. Uh, Let's mention the uh, the rocket launchers here, the launchers that we've got here. Do you want to talk about those, Gary? Um, this Cobra is, I'm telling you what, for helicopters and a gunship, this is it, man. Hi, Mike. We, we loved seeing these Cobras. And the rocket launchers are tubed, and it was called a TOW, a T-O-W. There's going to be a lot of acronyms today on the airplane. It stands for Tube Operated Optically Guided Wire missile that would be shot out against an anti it's an anti-tank weapon and then from there they upgraded to the maverick missiles which is a a amg something i think something a and g 65 which has an ir seeker head to find the tanks and the other tube here should be fairly familiar to everybody now this is the uh, 7.62 millimeter rockets and uh, these uh, hell cobras were used Used, still being used actually uh, in the Marine Corps as a forward air control airplane. In fact, when the Marine Corps introduced them in 1969 and is still using them today as a FAC platform, that makes uh, the Cobra the longest uh, performing FAC airplane ever. Uh, so uh, the 7.62s uh, could be used for, uh, for uh, uh, high explosives. They could be used for marking with Willie Pete and those kinds of things. But that's what we've got on this side. Now the toes are used by a lot of other things. I was a, a air liaison officer in a tank battalion for a while, and uh, and we had uh, jeeps uh, with tow missiles on them, which was a little bit like desert rats. But yeah. there's wire on the back of these missiles when they're fired, and so they are guided and controlled the entire time they're in flight by somebody. So on the jeeps, it was by a, it was by a, a person on the a missileer on the on the Jeep or in the Cobra, it's the person in the front cockpit. But what we're going to show you right now is a little bit of the back cockpit. Uh, first of all, I wanted to show you this item right here. It says static port. We've talked about these on the other airplanes. And so this is a place on the airplane that is dynam uh, aerodynamically uh, null or void. So there's no pressure at this point. And so when we take a look at the other pedostatic tubes that we've got, this is where the airplane measures the difference between the ram air force on a pedostatic tube and the static pressure on this point. And it can uh, then tell the airplane through air data computers and things like that, how fast it's going, how high it is, and that type of stuff. But uh, we're going to show you a little bit of the cockpit if I can do this without uh, breaking myself or something else. Uh, as you can see, this is steam gauges. I mean, this is old 1969 technology, so there's no, uh, there's no glass... Uh, uh, glass cockpits in in these airplanes. This is all uh, uh, all static, or this is all uh, analog gauges. Now you've got a control stick here in the front, uh, just like you would on most airplanes and most helicopters. Although this one, you can see on the front side, and if I can make the uh, the gimbal work properly, you've got triggers. You got a red one, and that means uh, that means ammunition or uh, or forward firing. Uh, gear of some sort can be uh, can be for the uh, for the missiles, and then you've got the, uh, uh, the the regular helicopter. Whoops, the regular helicopter controls over on the other side, which is the collective and the cyclic. But this and uh, and also the ever present uh, ashtray. Yes. In these airplanes, <laughs> <laughs> so you always had to have the ashtray. So and uh, and up here on the top is the gun sight. So the pilot in the back is the actual pilot or the helicopter aircraft commander. And in the front seat is uh, the person who's going to be a gunner. It's usually another pilot. And we'll talk about that when we get around to the other side. So we are going to show you the big gun. So this is, uh, this is one of the many guns. And uh, this is a, an, Army, an Army helicopter. But the Marine Corps also used these too. 20 millimeter, uh, yeah, ashtray, Mike likes that. Uh, <laughs> 20 millimeter uh, uh, Gatling gun. I believe it's an M197, 
when the Marine Corps and the Army both started with these airplanes, uh, they used mini guns and M79 grenade launchers. So it was kind of a combination turret. Uh, so one of the other differences here that you can see in the old style is that the canopy is flat. Now, in terms of escape or egress, uh, they had an explosive devices on the canopy. So they'd pull a handle and the, uh, and the canopy doors would blow off and the, and the glass would blow out. So now Gary worked with these uh, a lot when he was uh, uh, in Germany with the OV-10s. And I'm going to let you tell, he, he, let him tell you about uh, that experience. The uh, A-10s came out in uh, 1977, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> and the Army upgraded their Cobra helicopters in 1979. And everybody was all about the Eastern European bloc countries, we call it the Warsaw Pact, and Russia coming across Western Europe. And I was based in West Germany. The Berlin Wall was still up and the wall between the countries still up. And so there was the T-72 tank that had just gotten upgraded from the Russians, which had phenomenal amount of armor on it to protect it. And so they hid in the trees because, as you know, in Europe, it's all rolling hills with rolling trees. And so we began a new concept, which was called Joint Air Attack Tactics, J-A-A-T. And what we did with J-A-A-T is that the forward air controller, whether it be a ground fac forward air controller or an air fac, would coordinate with artillery to launch artillery shells to impact the battlefield. Then next would come the A-10s that would come over the hill and they would drop bombs and shoot their 30 millimeter armored piercing rounds to defeat the tanks. Then the Cobra helicopters would come up from what's called the nape of the earth. They'd be sitting below the trees. They would pop up and they would launch their tow missiles or Mavericks in the same way with the A-10s at the tanks. And then last but not least, the tanks would then fire on the tanks. So this is a massive amount of firepower going against the Russian or the Eastern Bloc countries. And cutting edge for us, the tactics, and man, I'm telling you what, these Cobra guys, woo, they were a lot of fun to work with. Well, you can see here in the, in the forward cockpit, this is all about controlling the forward weapons. You've got the scope and the controls there to control the, uh, the turret. You've also got a side stick controller, so they could fly the airplane from the front cockpit if they needed to, but it was normally from the back. But that's all the controls you need for the turret. Now we've got an, uh, a laser or an IR sensor here in the front, the laser designator. And then uh, what's the black thing here, Gary? Anybody got an idea what this might be? Anybody, this? anybody want to take roger up on that? Take a guess. This is what we call raw gear. Stand RWR, radar warning receiver. Am I right? I, think I that's believe what it was. so. Yeah. <laughs> we just called it raw. And what it would do is it allowed the pilot and the gunner to know if they had a radar lock on by an enemy aircraft so that they could do whatever tactics they needed to defeat the enemy aircraft. Now, you'll notice that uh, this is a three-barrel uh, three 20 millimeter cannon. It's uh, essentially a Gatling gun. And, oh, there's something else underneath here I'm going to show you. You might see this little device that looks like a hook. Here he'll point it out right there. Uh, there should be another one overhead. Very important. Yeah, very important. Very important. Because that's a wire cutter. And uh, that's As in telephone wires. Yeah, that's, that's there in the case that uh, they happen to come across since they're flying low to the ground in nape of the earth. If they catch a wire, it will cut it. And you'll see another one up on the top of the canopy. I think if I could show it to you there, that's, it's sticking out right there in the front underneath the blade. Yeah, Gary's pointing at it up there. So that's, uh, that's the other one. So if a wire comes over the top, it'll get, uh, it'll get cut off there. Now, these are big blades. These are much bigger than the, than the Kiowa blades. And uh, one of the things we were talking about earlier, let's see, does this, cover, uh, does this carry uh, flares and chaff? Yeah, they did. Yes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where the compartment for that is. I think it's up on the, uh, uh, I, if I remember right, I think they put it on the, uh, on the exterior of the airplane on that mm -hmm. flat square panel. But yeah, absolutely. And there's the pitot tube right above that. Uh, we don't have the other blade on the airplane yet. Uh, when we got it, it, it was missing two blades. But Marine Corps used the airplane differently. Uh, not completely differently, but somewhat differently. We're going to back up here so we can get a full view of the airplane. But uh, with the Marine Corps, 
uh, we used to go out with the OV-10s and we'd go out with a pair of Cobras. And the Cobras would be used for, for a couple of different things. They would be helicopter escorts. Uh, and I think I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier broadcasts that uh, in the OV-10s of the Marine Corps, you were a forward air controller first, and then later on you got more, a more senior designation, which was tactical air controller airborne, which uh, uh, allowed us, I'm going to try to talk over this airplane, which allowed us to uh, control an entire battlefield or, or an entire area of battle, not just a single target. So oftentimes we'd have the Cobras come in and they would be doing uh, escort duty for a CH-46 or something like that to, uh, to insert a recon team uh, or something more than that or escorting uh, 53s, whatever. But I showed you earlier the profile on this. This airplane was built based on the Huey, the UH-1 Huey. It was cut in half so the, the, canop or the cockpit is only 36 inches wide, same engine as the Huey at least to begin with. Uh, so it's pretty much a, a Huey. Uh, that was made to, to go out and fight. Now we used to work with the Cobra or the Cobras a lot in the Marine Corps uh, going out sniffing for targets and it was like working with a couple of really good hunting dogs. Yes. Uh, they would work on opposite uh, opposite sides of a, of a circle or a loop and uh, they would be down kind of sniffing around in the weeds and in the bushes until they'd find a target uh, and then we'd control it from there and it was always amazing to work with them at night uh, when they had the uh, the gun pods, the little tw the uh, uh, the the mini guns because it looked like a stream of lead at night and they would be on both ends of a circle so it was like continuously hosing a target down with the uh, with these uh, these beams of light that were coming down now the Marine Corps uh, kept the airplane where the army got rid of these when the uh, when the Apache was uh, was designed and built so the, the Marine Corps kept them and continued to develop them so you'll notice that this is a single engine uh, this is a single engine airplane as we'll move up uh, the Marine Corps went ahead and put two engines on them. They did some other work with the blades, and so we went through whiskeys, and now we've got the uh, the Zulu model, which is two engines and also has uh, four-bladed props. Here's an interesting thing. <clears throat> when the aircraft was first designed, it was designed to have retractable gear on it and to be able to fly faster that way. Question. Why did they not go with the retractable gear and put the skids back on them like all the other helicopters? Think about it, because we have a, a point about the speed of the blades while you're thinking, why did they put skids back on this aircraft? Anybody want to answer that? You're going to love it. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Gary. The reason why... <laughs> is because the army was afraid that somebody would land in the rice paddies with the gear up and sink down into the mud. So they put the skids back on it and because every helicopter pilot that was flying it was used to skids and many of them tried to land with the gear up. So just a simple procedure of trying to stay out of the rice paddies with the gear. So that's the reason why they didn't want to have them all mud, full of mud in the gear doors. And the speed of the blade is interesting because they have to watch out for something. Anybody got any idea? And it has to deal with the tip of the blade, of the rotor blade. That, uh, what about the, the tip on the rotor blades? Uh, supersonic. Supersonic. That's one of the reasons that the, the airplanes are speed limited. Uh, the blade tip can't exceed the speed of sound because then it uh, it goes out of control. That would be bad. Yeah, that would be bad. But these are helicopters too are had the ability to do, uh, uh, well, and they still do because the Marine Corps flying them, do rolls and, uh, and also do loops. And so they are almost fully acrobatic. Uh, I'm seeing some comments, but I'm having trouble reading the screen. We have a second Cobra here. Uh, the, the Cobra we were just looking at is one that uh, we have through the, uh, the General Services Administration. It is on permanent loan to us. Uh, the other one that's here is on loan to us through, uh, through the Veterans Administration. It's also an army uh, or an army model, but you can see it, it's got uh, it's got the full blades on it, uh, which we don't have on this one. But it does not have a cockpit. the The cockpit is empty on that one. But it's on a trailer, so we've uh, we've had it in parades. We take it out to events and things like that, so people can get up close and uh, and personal with a cobra. And a really cool shark's mouth painted on it too. Yeah. So let's uh, we can go over there and walk over there and take a look at this one a little bit. 
So the Cobra airspeed about 170 miles an hour, uh, pretty much top end. Uh, it can uh, service ceiling is about 12,000 feet. It's not pressurized or anything like that. Uh, but uh, of course, a variety of types of uh, armament that you can carry on it. Uh, this particular helicopter was uh, is painted in uh, in Marines on one side, and this is an Army helicopter. But it was it was done to honor. Uh, honor one of our local Marines, Lieutenant General uh, Richard Carey, who uh, passed away not too long ago, but a uh, noted Marine here. And also Hank Perry. Hank Perry worked with, uh, with Bell for quite a while. He may still be working with Bell. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm seeing something here, but uh, I've, I've got too much light on the screen, so I can't really see, but it's a comment from, uh, from, from David. So, uh, let me show you this one, the, the serial number on this one. They've even modified these Cobras to carry the Sidewinder missile, the heat-seeking missile uh, called an AIM-9L or Lima. And uh, I've gotten to fly with Lima and Mike AIM-9s when I was flying in the F-15 after my forward air controlling uh, assignment. The biggest enemy, air-to-air -air enemy for these Cobras was the Russian hind helicopter. It's like a Cobra on steroids because they could carry troops, whereas the Cobra cannot. Okay, David uh, David's telling me that uh, when he was with OH-58s, he got a uh, crew chief, he got an opportunity to fly in the front seat of one nice. of these. Uh, I did too. I got a chance to ride in the front seat a couple of times because we were looking for things, some things on the range. Some people had dropped some uh, Oops. some racks off the airplane. Uh, top speed here says 141 miles per hour. That's actually 141 knots. So the uh, actual speed is about 170 miles an hour. And uh, this one is a Sierra. Uh, it doesn't have any armament on it, so that's why we like uh, we like the other one. You know, because this uh, our other uh, our other Cobra is virtually a full up airplane. Uh, it does not have an engine in it, and uh, it can never be flown. But uh, but still, it's an it's an excellent example, especially in the uh, in the cockpit. Uh, That's what's really rare is to get an aircraft in a museum that has its full cockpit up. So yeah. we all get a chance to see what the guys had to do flying these things. It's usually it's usually been fairly well gutted. So uh, we're going to go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you another look inside the cockpit since we've been talking about some of this this kind of thing. And uh, let's see, I've got somebody here. We've got a question. They flew in wars. You know, we're not certain about about these. The the one we're looking at right now is too new. Uh, and I'll give you the serial number on this one. If anybody wants to look this one up. Uh, this one's considered an AH-1 Foxtrot. The Foxtrots were converted to uh, uh, to Sierras. Uh, but th this one was built in 82, so it missed everything. Uh, and for the last 15 years, it's been used uh, as for, for research and development work. Uh, the other helicopter, I believe, was like 79. So uh, we don't think that uh, we don't think that either one of these had any kind of combat uh, combat action. But you don't know, and it's hard to find out. Uh, it's it's hard to find out about helicopters and where they were and what they did. So you can see that the front here has got, got limited flight instruments over there on the right-hand side, not like the rear cockpit. Most of the rest of this is all, uh, is all systems, weapon systems. And don't forget the rear-view mirror because you rear want to see mirror. if anybody's coming up from behind you. Yeah. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. Yeah. But there's rear-view mirrors in a lot of airplanes. Uh, <laughs> the we had, we had and rear, the Eagle F-15 yeah, at it. We had rear-view mirrors in the, uh, in the OV-10. We had rear-view yeah. mirrors in the, uh, uh, in the F-4. So let you see the profile again here. We'll step back a little bit so you can see this the profile. This is one narrow aircraft, which, it, in that's what makes it such an agile aircraft and such a co a great combat weapon, because it's not big and broad, and uh, like the hind helicopter, which is an easy aircraft to target. This one, because of its narrowness and its maneuverability makes it much diffi more difficult to target than, say, the uh, Russian Hind helicopters, MI-24s, I think is what they were. Yeah. So, and, and the Marine Corps now uh, flies these things with a combination of the, uh, uh, of the Zulu Cobras and the, uh, uh, the X-ray Hueys. So they kind of fly together as a team now. 
I'll give you a close-up of the gun. And this is pretty much, uh, I, like I said, I believe this is an, um, an M179, so it's used on a lot of different, uh, a lot of different aircraft. Uh, not the A10. The A10 has got a much, much Big bigger 30 gun. 30-millimeter round that is uh, armored-piercing and is uranium-tipped. Where the whole purpose was to be able to penetrate the very thick front armor of the T-72 Russian tank. And then when the uh, Mavericks came out, it originally was an IR Maverick, so it could sense the heat. And then they came up with a, an advantage to it when I was there, and they deployed the double IR, which is imaging infrared uh, anti-tank missiles. And the Mavericks were just wonderful weapons to be able to stop the enemy. Uh, Joe Koppelman just made a, uh, a comment about uh, the use of these airplanes in, uh, in Desert Storm that the Army used the Foxtrots in, uh, in Desert Storm. Good deal. But it's already scrolled up, so I can't see the whole thing, Joe, but anybody who's watching sure can. Uh, Joe's a good friend of ours. He's been, uh, been associated with us for a long, long time, uh, actually when he was a young man. And uh, so now he's, he's done an awful lot of research work on a lot of different things. He's, he's working on... Uh, on stories and articles about backseaters and any number of different things. Joe's a, Joe's a good friend. We're glad to have him with us here today. So you can see there's much more in the way of flight instruments here, uh, engine instruments over on the left-hand side, uh, the ever-present eight-day clock. Yes. So when, uh, when, when you lose track of anything else to do uh, in an emergency, the last thing was always to wind the eight-day clock. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the handle on the side there with the yellow and black is uh, is the handle to jettison the canopy and you'll notice that it is safety wired safety wired hard we don't want to have we don't believe uh, we believe that the airplane was demilled uh, but uh, just as a safety precaution we've still got that uh, hard wired and pinned so we're uh, we're past our 20 minutes here going to get back to where you can get a profile of the airplane a little bit again uh, like to, again like to thank you for being with us here today uh, if you've got any questions, uh, please uh, send those along either now or later. Uh, Saturday, we're going to do the T-28, and I think uh, even though it's in kind of sad condition right now, it's got a fascinating story, and I think you're going to find it really interesting. So Gary and I will do the T-28 on Saturday. Let's see. Uh, Mike says, super information, guys. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that a lot. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Gary had a lot of experience with these in uh, in Germany, uh, with the OV-10, and and mine was uh, was with these with the with the Marine Corps. So from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas, uh, is another episode of Fun with Aviation. Uh, thanks. We hope you're all being safe. And in case you don't know, uh, we will be open on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we're doing an air park only opening since we uh, really can't do anything indoors yet. But uh, we are going to be open from 9 until, uh, 9 until 1 on Saturday and 11 until 3 on Sunday. If you're going to come out, we'd love to have you. We just want to ask you to, to pre-purchase your tickets on our, uh, on our website uh, so that we can, uh, uh, we can avoid, uh, avoid touching as much as possible. But you don't have to pre-buy your tickets, but we would appreciate it if you would. So, uh, once again, thanks for joining us today, and we will see you on Saturday.